Welcome to Tuesday evening, our midweek meeting here at Dunseverick Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us from your own home or on your mobile device. We really appreciate you taking this time this evening together around the Word of God and around the throne of prayer. We're going to pray now and then I'm going to bring uh, God's Word to our hearts. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this lovely opportunity to enjoy fellowship one with another, even though, Lord, uh, some are in their own homes or watching on this meeting, Lord, from diverse locations. But, Lord, we thank you that in the Spirit we can be one, united in our hearts, united in our salvation, and, Lord, later on, united around the Word of God, which is the Scriptures, and around the throne of God in supplication as well. Lord, we thank you for saving us. Bless our time together tonight. Encourage us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our Bible reading tonight is taken from John, or sorry, Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. We're looking at the final study in our series, Facing Life's Giants. And we're looking tonight at the giant of worldliness, or the world. So Genesis chapter 13, and we're going to read from verse 10. This is the story of Lot. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And we trust the Lord will bless the reading of his word to our hearts. If I mentioned the name George Best, even if you had no particular interest in football and soccer, it's a name of renown in Northern Ireland. George Best, in his heyday in the 1960s and 70s, at the height of his career, was considered possibly to be the best footballer on the planet. He had fortune, he had fans. He indeed had, it seemed, a great future ahead. During that time, he hosted a very lavish party in a London hotel. And he called for room service. And it was a Christian gentleman who worked in the hotel, who was a waiter, that attended on to Mr. Best and those who were gathered with him. And as the waiter entered into his room and saw the scene around him, he asked this question of George Best that totally stunned George Best. He said, Mr. Best, where did it all go wrong? He was at the height of his career. Fortune, fans, future, all lay ahead or around him. Yet this man could see that there was something very much wrong. Friends, he asked the question, where did it all go wrong? When we read in our text of Mr. Lot in Genesis chapter 13, you will already find if you were to read from the beginning of that chapter that he was a wealthy man. He seemed to be a wise man in the choice that he would make and the direction in his life would go. But friends, by Genesis chapter 19, as you meet him, firstly sitting in the gate of Sodom and then dwelling in the cave outside Zoar, you could ask Lot the exact same question. Mr. Lot, where did it all go wrong? You seem to have everything, but you ended up with nothing. We want to look at the life of Lot as we study the final in our series Facing our giants, because he faced 
the giant of worldliness. We want to note firstly about Lot, his conversion from the world. Second Peter chapter 2 and verses 6 to 8 actually speak about Lot. And it talks about just Lot, who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. That speaks about his life in Sodom. That righteous man is described as dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. There's two things about him there that we read. Firstly, he is described as just Lot, or indeed a righteous man. Now to be a righteous man, it means that you need to be right with God. There was at some stage in Lot's life, a moment when he turned from sin and turned onto the Savior. We must do that there to be declared righteous. You see, the term righteous denotes a juridical decision has been made or declared by the great judge in heaven, our heavenly father, who looking down upon you or looking down upon me, sees us no more as sinners but as saints. But something has to happen for that declaration to be made. There has to be real evidence of repentance in our life on a reception of the gift of God that is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, as God then looks down upon you and me, he declares us as being justified, as being saved. And as he looks upon us now, friends, there's that juridical sense in which as he looks upon us, we're not condemned anymore. In fact, as he looks upon us, he sees no more the old man, but you and I in Christ. It's called the imputed righteousness of Christ. You read of that in Romans chapter 4. And as God now looks down upon the saints of God, those who are saved by his grace, there he sees that Jesus has taken our sins upon his body, our punishment, and friends, we have received from him. Not just forgiveness of sins and our salvation, but Christ's righteousness. We're now clothed in Christ's righteousness. And that's what we read here of Lot. There was a moment, there was a time when he got saved. We can conjecture when that might be. I often think of whenever Abraham embraced him into his family. Genesis 12 and verse 5 reminds us of that. Whenever Abraham set out from Ur of the Chaldees and from Haran on his pilgrimage, looking for a city, remember he was looking for a city which was heaven there, he took Lot with him. Lot's father had died and Abraham was his uncle and he embraced him and brought him within the family. And I wonder, was there something said, was there something that he saw there that really impacted his life? And at that moment, the penny dropped and he says, Abraham is a saved man, I need to get saved. How did he know that? Well, in the scriptures there, we're told in Romans 4 and verse 5, that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So he saw something in Abraham's life. But he also, not only saw something in Abraham's life, he saw something that Abraham did. Because wherever Abraham went, he built. Now for you and me, it's about building homes today. However, Abraham lived in tents. He knew that his time here, his sojourn, as is described in Hebrews chapter 11, was a temporary one. So he didn't go around building himself mansions. No, he built altars. And I wonder, as they travelled on their journey there, in Genesis chapter 12, the first altar was built at Shechem, in verses 6 and 7. And friends, it says, And the Canaanite, and that were the pagans, they were then in the land. It was an altar of witness. It was a testimony to God's saving grace in his life. I wonder as he stopped there and he watched his uncle Abraham building it and then the sacrifice being offered, did the penny drop and suddenly he realized that's what it's all about. That's what motivates this man. That's what makes this man. I need that same lamb 
there that was sacrificed upon the altar to save me. And then he went on to Bethel and I and Ai between the two of them in verse 8. And there another altar was built. And it says and it was an altar unto the Lord and he called upon the name of the Lord. That just wasn't an altar of witness. That was an altar of, witness, of, of worship. So it was in song. Oh, I wonder where they're singing together. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I hope and pray that you sing that song and you mean that from your heart as well. The first point was his conversion from the world. There's real evidence that something dramatic happened in Lot's life. Secondly, his choice about the world. His choice about the world. And that brings us to our text. So it does. And it says there, And he lifted up his eyes and beheld the plains of Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the Garden of Eden, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest on to Zoar. Imagine what he beheld. There had been an issue between his herdsmen and those of Abram. And Abram said unto him in chapter 13 of Genesis and verse 8, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between thy herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we be brethren. Is that not vital in our church today? We must strive to keep the unity of the body and the unity of belief in the local church. And as churches recommence services uh, collectively within their buildings next Sunday, there we must consider there it's so vital that we maintain unity amongst the brethren and Abraham realized that and so he said look on this occasion to maintain that unity it means a separation between your herdsmen and mine if you go to the right I'll go to the left so avoiding this conflict that was how they decided they would deal with their issue we want to see then what Lot beheld. Well, we're told, so we are, that what he beheld was two places. Firstly, then Lot shows him all the plain of Jordan. There, so he did. And, and friends, it tells us that in that plain of Jordan, it was even there, it looked like the garden of the Lord. That is the garden of Eden. And I'm sure as he looked upon that, it seemed attractive, didn't it? But he should have been reminded that it was still the place of sin. Because Adam and Eve had been expulsed from it. Then it says not only it looked as if it was like the Garden of Eden, but like the land of Egypt. And friends, if... if the Garden of Eden was a place, well then we could say this about Egypt, it's always a picture, a picture of sin. Abraham had made a grave error in chapter 12 when famine come and then into chapter 13 there, Abraham had went down into Egypt seeking refuge, seeking rest and he only found rebuke. It was a move a direction he should never have taken as he stepped out of the will of the Lord. You don't find him building any altars in Egypt. There, in fact, he gets entwined in lies and deceit and is found out. And he too, just like his forefathers, Abraham, or, or Adam and Eve, who were expulsed from the Garden of Eden, Abraham was expulsed from Egypt. It was a picture of sin. And as he looked at these two places, the place of sin, the picture of sin, oh, I tell you now, it seems so appealing. It seems so appealing. You see, Lot was saved. That we cannot deny. But he was never truly separated from the world. And this reminds me just of the compromise. And in scripture, there are others like him. There we read of Demas in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, of whom Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He preferred the world to God and God's will. Friends, firstly there, what he beheld. Secondly then, what was it he really believed? 
When he looked upon the land, the fertile land that lay ahead of him, and it seemed in one way like the Garden of Eden, and seemed in another then like the land of Egypt, what was it then that he believed? It was this. I can witness for the Lord there. I can walk for the Lord there. I can worship the Lord there. There's a big however. Because we are told, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So what he beheld, what he believed, was determined by the fact of what he also knew. Because Sodom and Gomorrah lay directly in his path ahead. And he knew that he would have to walk there. He would have to work there. He would have to try to witness there. He would have to try to worship the Lord there. And so friends, we find firstly his choice about the world. As we continue on in our thoughts about Lot, there was his conversion from the world, his choice about the world, and then his chastening in the world. We remember that in Genesis 13 and verse 12, there that he pitched his tent towards Sodom, and everything began to go wrong from that point on. When he was in Sodom, and the angels come, and visited his home with a knock on the door. They said to him, flee for your life. And we read that he lingered. Why would a man who is saved want to linger in the world? Well, quite clearly, there he had a love for the world and a longing after it. His position, his prosperity, his pride. You see, for Lot, it was a case there that even though in Second Peter chapter 2, we read that he was vexed by the conversations of the world, he had become accustomed to them, to the voice of the world. And maybe he himself had thought that his words would be heard and make an impact, but not a bit of it. Not only was he vexed by the conversations of the world, but also we read in Second Peter chapter 2 that he was vexed by the conduct of the world. And just like the voices, he had become accustomed to it and to its vileness. And maybe he thought within himself, well, my witness will be seen and it will make an impact. But it didn't. How do we know? Because when he went to his sons-in-law and he told them what God was about to do and how his judgment would rain down from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and how they needed to flee the city, they laughed at him. They thought as though he was one mocking. Genesis 19 and verse 14. I tell you something, before the judgment fell upon the city, Lot already had lost things. He had lost his way. Clearly he had. He had lost his witness, his very sons-in-law laughed in his face when he began to tell them about God and judgment and righteousness. Then after the judgment fell down in the form of fire and brimstone and destroyed that city, well, he lost his wealth as well and all his prestige and position. And more sadly, he even lost his wife. Remember Lot's wife? Jesus tells us to remember her. So there she was, one step from entering in through the gate at Zoar and safety and salvation, and she halted and turned back and then was salted, turned into a pillar of salt, and she perished. Well, doesn't the word of God warn us? Remember, John was writing to believers when he wrote these words. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The chastening in the world that Lot received. My final point though, I want to end on a positive note. Conquest of the world. 
Is it possible, Pastor, as I face the giant of worldliness that surrounds me? Maybe you're the only Christian in a home. Maybe you're the only Christian at school or college or university. Maybe you're the only Christian in your community or in your place of employment. And you feel very alone and very vulnerable. But remember this, you're never alone and the Lord enables all of us to conquer this giant of the world. It was the 29th of May, 1953, whenever Sir Edmund Hillary from New Zealand and Sherpa Tensing from Nepal conquered the world. They climbed to the very peak of Mount Everest, 29,000 feet high, a bit higher than we are here around the North Antrim coast. And if you travel to that part of the world, you can follow the literal steps. They're called there. There's a route that's called Hillary Steps that will take you to the very peak so that you too can conquer the world. Spiritually speaking, how can we conquer the world? What's our route? Who's our example? Well, Abraham is a great example of one who conquered the world. He too was converted like Lot. He too had choices to make like Lot. And he too pitched his tent. Lot pitched it in the direction of Sodom and sin and paid a huge price for it. Abraham pitched his tent, firstly, in the direction of integrity of integrity. You see, we're told in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith he sojourned in a land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Abraham, the heirs with him of the same promise. That is significant because Abraham never made his home down here. He was always up there. He saw himself as passing through on his way to a higher calling and a higher place. And so must you and I. He pitched his tent in the direction of integrity whilst he lodged or sojourned in this country. It was not permanently, it was a temporary experience and he turned away from sin. We know that because in Genesis chapter 14, we find that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were invaded and Lot was already living there. Long before its destruction, we had this capitulation. And enemies come, surrounded, then invaded the city and they took off as with their loot. And that included Lot and all his family. And there, Abraham intervened. Because we be brethren. And friends, he went after him and rescued him, brought him back along with the rest of the inhabitants of the city. And the king of Sodom wanted to, to mark this notable event and, and he offered him whatever he wanted. And Abraham said, no. The only blessing that I want is the Lord's. Don't want to be tainted nor tempted by the things of the world. And he wouldn't touch it. Friends, he pitched his tent in the direction of integrity. He stayed away from sin and so must you and I. There was a complete separation. He also pitched his tent in devotion of intercession. Remember whenever the Lord revealed to him his plans to punish, to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 18. We find then Abraham on his knees pleading on behalf of its inhabitants. Now those inhabitants were exceedingly wicked before the Lord. If, if Lot's heart was vexed, Abraham's was too. Yet, he didn't want to see one perish. He prayed for their salvation. Remember how he started off, Lord, oh, there's 50 there, save them. 40, 30, 20, 10. He pleaded for their salvation. Friends, how we must plead as well before the throne of God. And we're going to do that in a moment or two. For those who are lost, the lost sheep. Friends, those who are lame. Those who are lame and who are sick. 
there who are God's saints and how we must pray for them and plead for them and intercede on their behalf that the Lord would move, the Lord would save, the Lord would sustain, the Lord would heal. Pitched his tent, the direction of integrity separated himself. Pitched his tent in the devotion of intercession, he supplicated with the Lord. And finally, he pitched his tent with dedication towards the instructions that he had received. You see, he always was looking for the city. He always was looking to the Lord, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And that takes us right through to Genesis chapter 22. And there we read that God gave him instructions. You see yonder mountain, I want you to go there to the place. And so he went, it was to Mount Moriah. And there's a provision for you. There's wood. There's all you need to build an altar. And it was another altar that he built there. This time it just wasn't the altar of witness and the altar of worship. But this time, friends, this was to be an altar in which he would lay his very son, we Isaac, down upon. And there he would be prepared to sacrifice him. And he took the knife out. And at that moment when he was about to obey God right to the letter and plunge it into his son, God said, stop. Turn round. As he turned round, there was a provision. You see, we Isaac had asked him, going up the mountain, Daddy, have we question for you, Dad? There. we've got the firewood we've got, we've got everything for the altar but, but where's the lamb daddy we need a lamb and old Abraham said to his wee son God will provide himself a lamb and so he did caught by the thicket remember there by its horns so that its flesh would not have been defiled and so it was able to be used a lamb without blemish without spot it become a substitute and so Jesus become your substitute and mine, taking upon himself your sins and mine. Friends, there, he, he continued in his devotional walk. He continued there in that direction and he continued in his dedication until the Lord took him home. And may you and I be given grace to do the same and to conquer the giant of worldliness in our lives. May the Lord bless you and thank you for listening. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word to our hearts tonight. And as we've looked at this series of different giants, we pray that as we've brought it to a conclusion, that this last one, Lord, is one that afflicts all Christians on all sides. But we thank you that we can conquer the world in and through the presence and the power and the provision of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us never to be like Lot and Lord, to be content with the things of this world, but rather the things of the word of God that would saturate us, that would sustain us and Lord, that would bless us day and daily. So we thank you, Lord, that you have overcome the world and we as thy children can be overcomers as well and conquerors in Jesus' name. Amen. At this point, I'm going to deal with the announcements and then the prayer points and requests. Again, thank you for joining us this evening. With regards then our church and meetings, etc. Do remember that each day there's thought for the day on our Facebook page. Also the telephone devotional line. They will continue on for the foreseeable future. Thank you to all those who contribute to them. Then on the Lord's Day, we have our services here at church. Now, I know that the Stormont Executive have now given permission to return to the church buildings to have collective worship. However, our office bearers met last week and our feeling is at this time, due to size constraint upon our building and the number of visitors that we have up around the coast during the month of July, that we are not going to have a service within the church building. Rather, both of our services will be in the form of a drive-in service. So at 11 a.m. and 7 p.m., please come along to our drive-in services. Been having great numbers since we started way back in May. And please come along and be blessed through the word of the Lord. Now with regards our prayer requests, 
Please remember little Hannah Smith in the Royal. Even though she's out of ICU, she continues to be quite unwell and needs our prayers, as does her daddy, Ryan, and the family circle. Also remember Siobhan McConaughey, who had treatment last week for her cancer and is at home um, and doing quite well. Continue to pray God's healing upon her. Also, Gary Graham, who has now been moved from the Royal to the Antrim Hospital, having had treatment for his brain tumour, please pray for him. Let's now unite our hearts together. Pray for the meetings this weekend that God will save souls. Let's pray. Dear Lord, bless us now and continue with us throughout this time of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.